in network dominance. Because it is a race, you know? It really is a race for dominance of your time, dominance of your mind space, dominance of your information. If any of you guys have been paying attention to the Facebook uh, secure privacy issues, basically Facebook owns you. It's like if you have ever logged on to Facebook, and even if you haven't, they just own your stuff. They have so many servers they never delete any of the images that are put up on Facebook. So if you have that one picture of you doing a naked headstand um, on college property, it's still there, even if you told someone to delink it. Um, that's something that people don't think about as much, but, they, the, but the biggest data engines in the world you know, are now becoming social networks. So there's all sorts of functions that social networks play. One of them is to basically store the lives, the preferences, the thoughts, the comments of people. Um, I would really tell, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that we're all sophisticates here, but just don't put anything on a social network that you wouldn't want on the front page of the newspaper. So, <laughs> but you can see why this is so valuable because there's a data map being created of who you like, who you know, what your political affiliations are, your dating habits, just everything. And the idea, of course, is at some point, if not right now, to monetize that, to turn it into a kind of gold where people can make money off of like, oh, you, you like, you know, you peered in pale blue t-shirts in 15 of the 957 you know, images we have of you on file, perhaps you would like another pale blue t-shirt. We haven't gotten quite to that level yet, but there's a reason that people are paying enormous costs to store all that data. Image data and video data are, of course, you know, the largest files. And they, you know, over time they cost a lot of money, and now there's a question, if Facebook doesn't start earning more money, will they actually be able to keep that policy, or will they have to start dumping data? But for now, it's all there. Um, Global mobile penetration, you know, uh, here in the U.S., um, basically white Americans are the most likely to use desktop and laptop as their primary, you know, means of accessing the internet and means of accessing electronic data. And for African Americans and for English-speaking Latinos, mobile is actually more of what people plug into. Um, but when you look globally, you've got, again, all this data out there. Um, there's news and information that's being pushed directly by companies. But then there's also all of this exchange. I put a link on Facebook. Somebody else shares that link. All of that is kept within these systems. Um, and mobile is something where you know I tweet from my iPhone. And when I was in India, I was in India for a, a world leadership conference this fall, and I was tweeting images on a platform called TwitPic, but I was tweeting images of people picking, harvesting rice by hand in the rural areas. I was tweeting images of you know, small cemeteries and villages. I was also tweeting images from Bangalore, the tech capital. You know, but I was able, because of the mobile networks there, um, I decided not to use my phone, but I, what I did do was buy a data roaming plan. And so you can actually do Skype, which is, you know, you can have phone conversations using data networks. Um, so I could have used Skype to talk to people, but instead what I chose to do was to basically create a photo blog of my journey through southern India. And that's a specific and, you know, somewhat self-indulgent pastime, but there are people who use, there's a couple of seats in the front, there's uh, seats here, there's a seat there, but come on, come on up front. But one of the things um, is that you see some, some really um, interesting trends uh, around the use of mobile to empower purely ripped off by middlemen as they took their goods to market, and of course taking you know, fresh vegetables to market or fresh fish to market you just don't have a lot of time to make decisions about how to, how to take them and where to take them. Now you can go and using an icon-based system, and I'm forgetting the name, someone might know it, but there's, there's several of these systems, but one of them is an icon-based system 
that allows you to check the market price in different markets. So if you're in an area between three different markets and you've got some fresh fish, it will allow you to check the market price in each of those markets. So you go to the market where you can get the most money. Um, that use of mobile is transforming people's lives on a very basic level. And in one village, it was able to increase the income of people fourfold just by them having that information because they didn't have to rely on middlemen. They could go to the market that suited them the best. So mobile um, is, you know, there's been an evolutionary leap while we are in the, in the West, you know, in, in the U.S. in particular, um, often desk bound or scrounging around looking for a plug in an airport so that we can put our laptop in there. Um, a lot of people have moved straight to the mobile platform and social media has all gone mobile. You know, you can access just about anything. So the, the question is, you know, there, there had been a false dichotomy between uh, old media and new media. And I think that what you're seeing is, is a hybrid model that's developing. So you had, for example, in Iran, you had reporters from mainstream news organizations in Iran. Most of them were kicked out. And then, even before then, but certainly once the reporters were kicked out, you had people video blogging, taking images, putting them up on Twitter, putting them up on YouTube, reverbing them, you know, all of these sort of echo chambers that were set up to get citizen journalism, field reporting out there. And then you saw CNN and other places relying on those feeds. And it became a very powerful but uncomfortable moment because you cannot always verify information. You know, so there was a lot of unverified information flowing through the pipelines, but there was almost no choice. There was, there was no, I think that the, the best thing that you could have done then, which, which a lot of people did, was acknowledge all we have is a series of unverified images. All we have is a series of unverified videos you will have to read what you can and understand as much as you can to make sense of this as we in the newsroom are trying to do ourselves. Um, but you saw the State Department step in. This was very interesting. The State Department has what's called the Digital Democracy Initiative, and most platforms do. You know, it, it has to evolve its servers, it has to constantly um, make sure that it has the capacity to deal with the number of people who want to use it. So, so Twitter was scheduled to go down for maintenance during the height of this Iran election mayhem. And the State Department stepped in. A lot of individuals said, don't do it, don't go down, don't go down. And then the State Department actually stepped in and said, don't, don't do it. And that was an interesting moment where you had the US government advocating a private US technology company not to do scheduled maintenance because it might affect a democratic movement in another nation. That's really interesting, complicated. Um, and now you see the digital democracy wing of the State Department stepping in when you have Google versus China, you know, where China is <coughs> allegedly using denial of service attacks and hacking into Google because Google has a lot of information, and China prefers to restrict information, particularly about areas like Tibet. And so you're seeing this, you know, the questions of who controls data becoming very interconnected and very messy, for lack of a better term. You have individuals who might be at the right place at the right time, or sometimes more like the wrong place at the right time, seeing someone get shot by you know, uh, a security officer in Iran, seeing the earthquake in Haiti, have individuals gathering information. You have that information going through private companies like Twitter and YouTube, um, then being filtered through the lens of international diplomacy and being filtered through mainstream media. So you can see that it's, a, it's very much a multiplayer game. And what might have happened before is you might have had a foreign correspondent from a big publication or outlet, and now you have a lot of different individuals involved in the game. Just a couple of case studies I want to talk about in the US that I think everyone's familiar with. One is Gina Six, um, 
And basically, when you had this question of why these young black men were convicted of assault in the Gina Six case, you had uh, you know, a cry for justice and reassessment of the sentencing. But a group called the Color of Change.org basically managed to do digital organizing to get people to a physical location in a very powerful way. The Color of Change is designed to do you know, what some people call net roots organizing. So it had an online campaign saying, this is an outrage. We've got to get some people down to Gina, Louisiana. Um, and as a result of that, I remember interviewing a, um, a student at Morehouse, and that's the audio that will fire in a second, but we won't bother listening to all of it. But basically, the student at Morehouse University you know, heard, got some email forwarded from a friend who got it forwarded from a friend about, like, let's go to Gina. He went around to local businesses in Atlanta and said, hey, you know, we want to put a bunch of people on a bus to do this civil rights protest in Louisiana, but we're broke students and we don't have any money. Can you give us some money so we can go down to Louisiana? The businesses kicked in the money. He got, you know, a busload of students to go down. And there were quite substantial protests. Um, and you know, you can see that this net roots organizing actually produced um, quite a significant physical turnout. And of course, mainstream media picked it up, but it really was something that started out as internet organizing. So uh, you know, again, in the same way that media is no longer either the big guys or the small guys, things like activism and civil rights organizing are no longer the big organizations or the small folks. It is all looped together and the thing, the, the, the stream that binds it is really, you know, the, the digital world and the digital connections. So um, this one, very easy to recognize. Uh, President Obama made huge use of digital networking, and I think we're familiar with, you know, the, the, just the sheer volume of social networking, you know, for example, somewhat similar to Gina, different, but like, you know, all the house parties. Let's send out a bunch of emails and then get people to gather in physical locations to do things, to raise money, to raise awareness. Again, this idea that it's not just online, it's not just offline, it's online creating the synergy that then produces action and produces money. Um, you know, the McCain campaign did have some, you know, you can see the join the team and, you know, recruit friends, but they did not access to the same extent that the Obama campaign did. And I think one of the things is that, that the Obama campaign went straight to Silicon Valley and they were like, yo, we need some help over here. And so you had people who were coders and programmers and CEOs who were pitching in in a way that you didn't see um, with the mccain palin campaign. But I'm sure that come 2010 for the midterms in 2012, we're going to see a lot of difference. Now, one of the questions that came up for me was, you know, there was a big shiny happy diversity face that was painted about this digital organizing, but on the fundamental side of the Silicon Valley powers who raised the initial money and who you know, provided a lot of technology, Silicon Valley is not the most diverse place in the world. And I think that you know, in 